This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the Paradoxical Eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Thank you so much for having me. So unlike most of your other speakers, I actually work with contemporary humans and not fossils, but I will try to maintain your attention anyway. Um, I am mostly interested in human evolution. Um, and as you've noticed from these diagrams that people have put up regarding the phylogeny of Neanderthals and Denisovans and modern humans, modern humans often get represented as sort of just a, a single branch or maybe a few genomes that come off this other branch. And so what I want to do is really take a little bit of time and conceptualize what it means to refer to the Homo sapiens as a single species. Did we have a single origin? Um, there's actually a lot of complexity in this question, which isn't necessarily addressed by one of these simple tripart phylogenies. So let's just break down kind of the no working model we have for human evolution, um, which is mostly based on contemporary DNA. So if we start out in Africa, roughly about 100,000 years ago, I'm an advocate of a Southern African origin. I'm not going to try to convince you of that today. But we actually don't know where in Africa there was a single origin of the Homo sapiens species, if indeed it was a single origin model. All right. And then from Southern Africa, putatively, um, there is a migration and dispersal into the rest of the African continent. And certainly by 60, maybe even slightly earlier, 50,000, uh, sorry, 70,000 years, there were these um, uh, individuals living in northeastern Africa, at which time there was what we call a founder event. So these populations moved out of Africa into the Near East. Now, this event is actually a major event in human evolution, or at least in the genomes of all non-Africans living today. And that is because there was a strong reduction in genetic diversity during this founder event. And that's indicated here by the fat, fat arrow. Okay? So every time you see a fat arrow on this map, that indicates a reduction in genetic diversity. Once humans left Africa, these individuals spread rapidly across the Eurasian continent. There are some hypotheses of what they call um, the South Indian or South Asian uh, migration route, which is along the coast um, of the Indian subcontinent and eventually into Southeast Asia and Oceania, certainly by 45,000 years ago, as well as additional migrations into Northern Asia and eventually into the Americas, where it was accompanied by yet another strong founder event or population bottleneck, which reduced the genetic diversity of those populations. And we'll hear a little bit more about that today um, from Maria. 
So that's our, our basic model of um, human evolution over the last 100,000 years. But you'll notice that um, there's not a lot of detail in Africa, actually. There's just a few arrows and some general little dates. Geneticists love to put arrows on maps, and I am no exception. So I'd like to instead think about posing this question, where in Africa did humans originate? And there are different types of genetic evidence or uh, other types of evidence one might use to answer this question. And so um, I'm, there's a sort of presentation here, this is by uh, Bettini and Joblin, where they suggest different types of evidence one could look at. So you could look at, for example, non-genetic evidence, skulls that have been dug up from the ground by paleoanthropologists, you could look at um, evidence of what we call symbolic behavior, such as um, the making of art, so shell beads, or these little cross-hatched ochre pieces that have been discovered. You might even look at language. So there's a really fascinating paper um, from a few years ago that looked at phonemic diversity, not genetic diversity, but looking at the number of phonemes in different languages, and can we learn anything about the origins of language by the amount of diversity that's present in phonemes, and he argued, indeed, um, Africa has the highest phonemic diversity, and in particular, even southern Africa has the highest phonemic diversity. Um, so I'm a geneticist. I focus on a different type of evidence. And you can break down genetic evidence also into these little patches. So one might be the mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA, as we've heard from other speakers, is something that's inherited um, through the maternal lineage. So the mother passes it on to her children, and then it's passed on from the daughter to her children. Um, alternatively, you could look at the Y chromosome, which has a different pattern of inheritance from father to son, and so on and so on, so on for many generations. And then last are what we call the autosomes, which are the remainder of the chromosomes 1 through 22 that compose the rest of your genome. So when this was done, and this uh, slide is a little bit dated, but from mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA, it was a little bit hard to pinpoint precisely where the deepest divergence was within Africa. I'm going to address that again later. Um, but at least from the autosomal information, both of you look at SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, just your vanilla mutation. Um, uh, they actually have the highest genetic diversity, or heterozygosity, in southern African populations, and even other types of polymorphism, like microsatellites, also look like they had the highest diversity in southern African populations. And so we're getting a lot of conflicting pieces of information, maybe from non-genetic evidence, from genetic evidence. So how can we sort of conceptualize synthesizing all this information? So I'm actually an anthropologist by training. Um, despite the fact that I do genetics. And so I like to sort of begin with the paleoanthropology, and that's what we're going to do right now. Um, so there's a fantastic amount of information that's been um, excavated from the fossil record. And some of this information comes in the form of bones, right, like we've seen earlier in the talk. And on the right here, you have a fossil cranium from Herto, Ethiopia, that was dug up. And it looks like, morphologically, it's very similar to modern humans. So the um, front part of the, the, um, sc the skull is actually tucked in underneath the brow ridge. The skull is actually pretty short from front to back. Uh, the brain size is, of course, equivalent to what you would see in contemporary human populations today. And if we put flesh on this individual, they would probably look relatively similar to other human sapiens um, around the world. However, so we know that there was morphologically individuals that were probably similar to Homo sapiens walking around Africa at least 150,000 years ago. But in fact, there's a lot of additional information that can be gleaned from stone tools. So there's a uh, phrase that's called the Middle Stone Age. And the Middle Stone Age refers at least roughly to 250,000 years ago to 50,000 years ago. And on this other map, what you see are sites in Africa where Middle Stone Age artifacts have been recovered. So we know that hominin populations were living in these areas of Africa during this time period. And what you'll notice, right, is that there's maybe not that many examples of this beautifully reconstructed skull from all over Africa, but there are many, many geographic locations on this map that actually date back to the Middle Stone Age. And so what does that mean? So that means, of course, that there were 
lots of hominins walking around the face of Africa during this time period. And in fact, there's also good evidence from North Africa as well, even though it's cut off in this particular, this particular map. And so let's just kind of make a little schematic and, and start to think about this. So if I look back into Africa 150,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago, I know that there are Homo sapien-like populations, broadly speaking, that exist in different parts of the landscape. And so we can ask a relatively simple question, were these populations structured, okay? And that means, are they different from one another? So perhaps we have populations in North Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa. There's less information from Central Africa for various reasons. And these environments may have been very different from one another. So you might have had you know, a cool Mediterranean climate up in North Africa, and then a very hot desert-like climate, let's say, in Southern Africa. And the question then is, are these populations really separate from one another, or are individuals moving in between them? So population geneticists like to refer to this concept of popu as population structure. So let me just explain what that is briefly. Um, in this kind of little schematic, we have a SNP, or a single nucleotide polymorphism, up on the top that either comes in red or yellow. And we have two populations on either side of this river, and we can see that they are very different from one another. So individuals on one side of the river carry only the red allele, and individuals on the other side of the river only carry the yellow allele. And this is um, structured populations, or populations where there are strong differences in allele frequency. And this is in contrast, down to the bottom, of populations which are carrying both the purple and the orange alleles because there's migration between these two populations, or gene flow, if you refer to your little glossary on the handout. And this is because I've given them a nice little bridge so people can walk across and, and mig migrate. So we can just sort of uh, take that example and apply it to the rest of Africa as well. So were these populations structured at 200 and 150,000 years ago, or was there actually what we call panmixia, or lots of migration among the different subpopulations? And um, <laughs> I think we have an actual answer to this particular question, but it's somewhat complicated to infer, in fact. And one thing to point out is that in either of these scenarios, if you're thinking back to what the landscape would have looked like 200,000 years ago, means that if I went and sampled individuals from across the African landscape, their common ancestor, in terms of their genetics, would have been very old. It would actually predate 150,000 years ago or 200,000 years ago. In order to understand why that is, you have to, again, take a little mini class in population genetics here and think about the difference between populations and the difference, the difference between populations and genes. So this is what we call a gene genealogy, which is represented by these little lineages right here. And these lineages exist within these two different populations. Okay, so we can sort of trace back the common ancestry of a given genetic segment to um, where that uh, individual shares a common ancestor. And these common ancestors exist in some ancestral population, which I'm gonna then let evolve through time. So now we have this common ancestral population, and there's been some sort of divergence, and it's diverged into a blue and orange populations. And you can see that these gene genealogies, these genetic lineages, are sort of splitting nicely into the blue and orange population. And then finally, at the present day, or down here, you know, I might go and sample individuals from the orange population, the blue population, and then ask when their common ancestor was, okay? And that common ancestor is indicated up here, just like in a normal phylogeny. The key thing to remember, actually, when you're looking at that, is that the common ancestor predates the population divergence, okay? And this is the case for most of the loci that we would look at in the human genome. So the common ancestor must be older than the population divergence. So then we can ask, how old are the common genetic lineages within human populations? So I'm gonna do this for a relatively simple locus, the Y chromosome, right? So the Y chromosome, again, is just passed on between father and son. And one of the nice things about the Y chromosome is that it's relatively small. So it's easy to go in and sequence it from many individuals. So a few years ago, we captured about 10 megabases of the Y chromosome, a variety of individuals across human populations. And we actually had a strong focus here on sampling African populations, because that's what I'm obsessed with, is African populations. 
Um, and what you'll see is all the African individuals are sort of on the bottom half of this segment, and you're just looking at a normal gene genealogy or phylogeny that's been flipped on its side. So the common ancestor is right here, and then each one of these lineages represents a single individual's Y chromosome that was sampled from a man. Now the first thing, obviously, to notice is that um, individuals from outside of Africa have very little genetic diversity on their Y chromosomes compared to individuals from Africa. And you can easily see that by their relatively short branch lengths up here. So these are all the out of African individuals. Okay? So people from Cambodia, people from the Americas, people from Europe, and so on. And instead, if I look within Africa, I see individuals that carry really, really long branches. Okay? So for example, individuals from West Africa and North Africa diverge around here, and individuals that are from these African hunter-gatherer populations, which are particularly special, carry extraordinarily long branches all the way to, back to the common ancestor. So that graph can be a little bit hard to read for some people who are not geneticists, so I've tried to make um, a schematic. If we look at the time to the common ancestor and we try to date in years how, how long ago that might have been, we can kind of put an upper bound on the population divergence among all human populations. And so when we do this with the Y chromosome, what you actually see is that the upper bound on population divergence would have been around 150,000 years ago, plus or minus a couple tens of thousands of years. Okay, So we're actually seeing relatively shallow divergence among contemporary human populations. And with a little bit of additional modeling, we can actually say, well, which population diverged first from all other human populations, and when was that? And at least looking at the Y chromosome sequence, it's most likely to have been these Khoisan populations from southern Africa, and we date it to approximately around 90,000 years ago. Now, you could say, well, that's just the Y chromosome. It's just a single locus, and it has this bizarre pattern of inheritance from father to son. So independently, there was additional papers published by Grinnell and also Virama, um, uh, approximately about a year before we were published our Y chromosome work. And they actually independently came up with a very similar estimate on this time of population divergence between these southern African hunter-gatherer groups and the other humans within Africa. And that time of population divergence is approximately 100 to 120,000 years ago. So again, what you're seeing is that the gene genealogies certainly go back in time, but the actual time depth of this population divergence is quite shallow. Okay? And if we try to map that on to these um, sort of schematics of Africa, what would that mean? It means that neither of those two maps that I showed you before could really represent an, the actual true ancestors to the human population. So something must have happened to reduce the genetic diversity between 200,000 years ago and 100,000 years ago. And so let's just think for a moment what that might have been or what that could have looked like. So one hypothesis could be that there was a strong population bottleneck during this time period, 200 to 100,000 years ago. And um, maybe that bottleneck was associated, for example, with climate. So populations actually could have moved from one region to another because of climatic fluctuations. And in this case, I've had all the individuals that are living in Eastern Africa and Northern Africa just sort of trickle down and move into Southern Africa where things were nice during that time period. Um, <laughs> that doesn't have to necessarily be the only location. It's just one example. This movement into a refugium would likely have been accompanied by a population bottleneck. As you can imagine, um, if things are stressful in a given environment, then usually uh, what we see is a reduction in population size. Conversely, you could also think about it in a slightly different way. Maybe there was some stressful climatic experience, um, and that these other populations simply went extinct. Okay, so you have local extinction events, for example, here in Eastern Africa or Northern Africa, and only a population persists in one geographic region, again indicated here by these little X's in Southern Africa then what would have happened, right? So then at 100,000 years ago, we know uh, humans begin expanding again. Uh, so if they did sort of localize to one specific place on the African continent, what would then, then, then look like? They would have expanded into these other regions again, but maybe they absorbed individuals that persisted there, so maybe there wasn't complete extinction events in these other geographic regions, or indeed maybe 
um, all these individuals that were living in Eastern and, and Northern Africa did completely go extinct, and we don't see their signatures in the human genome. So this, I wanna sort of end by emphasizing that this is a, a single origin model for the modern human species, but it fits the data actually quite nicely because of this shallow divergence we see in the genetic lineages. And um, I will emphasize that there is a lot of additional sequencing that needs to be done, particularly in African populations, where we probably have the fewest samples um, of full human genomes that have been sequenced. And we really need to actually think explicitly about testing these models in a context that connects the genetic data with the paleoanthropological information. And I will stop right there. Thank you very much. So thanks for the invitation. So I would uh, like to talk today about a more recent chapter in human history. So we have heard a lot about the early chapters of human history today, about the early evolution of modern humans in Africa, and also about the interaction between archaic humans and uh, early modern humans. But I would like to talk today and uh, turn our focus from the Ice Age, the Pleistocene, into the Holocene, so into the last 10,000 years of human history. And I, try to convince you that this is also an extremely exciting time period where we even see a lot of changes even in human evolution and in human phenotype in several parts of the world. So as I mentioned, we are um, actually living today in this uh, time period, the Holocene, which is a time period of relative climate stability. Some people might even say that we have actually changed our environment so much that we're now living in a time period which we call the Anthropocene, which might have started in the last 2,000 years, but the main focus of this talk should really be the Holocene to the last 2,000 years, or, uh, sorry, the last 10,000 years of human history. Most of this time period, actually, we do not have historical documents. So we have no information that people wrote down about human history in this last 10,000 years. So we usually have to rely on archaeological information, for example, or paleoanthropological findings, so human skeletons, for example, that might tell us something about things that changed in the past, the so same thing, for example, like a, a migration, genetic admixture, or a, a genetic turnover of the human population. But we and others have actually started in the last um, a few years to um, use genetic data to tell us something about uh, changes that happened recently in um, our uh, evolution or in human history. And uh, I would like to focus my talk today about one event that archaeologists had owned already identified many years ago, and that is probably the biggest change in uh, human history that happened um, in the last few million years. It is actually the change from the subsistence strategy of hunting and gathering to uh, Neolithic farmers that relied on agriculture and started to domesticate animals. And this revolution, this big change in human history is called the Neolithic Revolution. So this Neolithic Revolution started in Central Europe about seven and a half thousand years ago and in other parts of the world a few thousand years earlier and a few thousand years later. But this big change is really the cornerstone of our modern um, civilization because it provided people then with resources that actually allow us to sustain millions and even billions of people today. And um, that uh, basically came with this big change from this foraging lifestyle to this early farming lifestyle. What archaeologists have debated for more than 100 years now is whether this change of um, subsistence strategy from foraging to farming was actually related due to the spread of ideas and culture. So was it just culture and ideas that were passed on from village or from region to region? Or was it actually people that were bringing agriculture to different parts of the world, for example, to Central Europe about 7,000 years ago? So this big question, was it pots or people that basically then spread agriculture um, into Europe and other parts of the world? And this question is very hard to address just based on archaeological um, artifacts, for example, or anthropological findings, because it is very difficult to really see if biological identity of people uh, changes just based on archaeological artifact. And this is actually a question which is much easier to address if we look at genetic data. So if we look at the DNA, if we look at the genetic makeup of the people, because it makes um, very clear predictions for these two different hypotheses, whether it was ideas that were spreading during that time or whether it was actually people. 
So if we assume that ideas and culture was, for example, spreading um, agriculture, we would expect that there would be direct genetic continuity between, for example, the first people that lived in Europe, foragers, then thousands of years ago, and then the first Neolithic people, and then the people that live in Europe today. So you would see genetic continuity if it was just a spread of ideas. However, if it was actually people spreading agriculture, for example, into Europe, we would expect a genetic discontinuity. We would something see that's called the diff uh, demic diffusion. We would actually see that people would um, then, for example, come to Europe and change the genetic structure, so new genes would arrive, for example, in Europe. And we and many others have tried to address this question based on mitochondria, but as we have seen in some of the previous talks, mitochondrial DNA can be quite decisive. So therefore, we have decided then in the last few years to actually study whole genomes of early uh, farmers as well as uh, late um, hunter-gatherers, so ancient foragers, to study this question whether there was actually a genetic change of people when agriculture was introduced to Europe or whether there was direct genetic continuity. So we have sequenced genomes of about 12 early hunter-gatherers some years ago and combined that with data sets that had been uh, provided by other people, for example, like the Iceman genome, this uh, famous Tyrolean uh, mummy that was discovered a few years ago and was actually frozen for about 5,000 years in the Alps, as well as a genome from a hunter-gatherer that was um, found here in Spain some years ago. And we then compared those ancient human genomes with the genome of about 2,000 people that uh, come from various populations, about 200 populations in the world today, with a data set that is called the Human Origins data set, and it has basically genome-wide data of now up to 5,000 people from many different populations in the world. If you then take genomic data from ancient and modern people and you want to compare that, you can imagine you have heard those genomes are really big, there's a lot of data, and one way to break down this data into two dimensions that you can actually look at is a so-called principal component analysis, where you basically take this genetic information from all those people and break it down into two most informative components, principal component one and two, and if you do that for modern people, you get those beautiful, colorful clouds that you see here. And actually, if you look at the right cloud here, this cloud is actually people that live today in northern Africa, in the Near East, as well as in the Caucasus. So you actually see this client that stretches from northern Africa into the Caucasus. Those populations here are populations that live in Europe today. So people that live, for example, in Iberia, France, Central um, Europe, as well as uh, Great Britain or Russia. And what you actually see here almost resembles geography. If you imagine this is kind of the northern African coast, this is the Near East, here could be the Black Sea, this could be the Mediterranean. So it could be an isolation by distance, people moved into those places and then basically genetically slowly changed over time. However, if we now look at our ancient individuals, our ancient foragers, as well as the early farmers from 7,000 years ago, we first see that our ancient foragers are genetically actually quite distinct from the people that live in Europe today. So there seems to have been not a strong continuity between the ancient foragers and modern Europeans. So basically there are no modern Europeans that live today that look genetically like ancient foragers. This is actually different for the ancient farmers. So those 7,000 year old farmers from Central Europe, they actually do cluster with populations that live in Europe today. You can see this little green cloud here. If you look at this cloud, this is actually people that live in Sardinia today. And this was already discovered when the ice man genome was sequenced some years ago. The colleagues actually found that the ice man looked genetically very similar to people that live in Sardinia today. And that actually made the authors to hypothesize that maybe he was some sort of tourist from Sardinia <laughs> that had gotten lost in the Alps and just died there and froze to death. Um, Today we actually know that this was not quite the case because we now have genomic data from many early farmers from Scandinavia, from Iberia, from Central Europe, from Southern Europe, and they all cluster together with Sardinians. So it is not that they all come from Sardinia, it is rather that modern Sardinians look genetically like early farmers. But what you then also see is that people that live in Europe today are not just a simple mixture between those ancient populations, so the foragers and the farmers, we actually stretch all the way up here, and if you can actually see those little diamonds up there, there's some more ancient genomes which are on this plot, and that are actually populations 
which we call ancient North Eurasians, which are best represented by people that lived about 10 to 20,000 years ago in Siberia. For example, one child that was sequenced by the group in Copenhagen from Lake Baikal, which is called the Malta child. So you see that modern Europeans seem to be a mixture between those three ancient uh, genetic um, populations. But what is also very clear is that if you look at that, neither the ancient farmer nor the ancient forager seem to have this North Eurasian component. So this North Eurasian component is actually quite distinct. And we wanted to find out when did this ancient North Eurasian component arrive in Europe. To do that, we teamed up with um, David Rice's team as well as Svante de Pebo and collected also data from the team in Copenhagen and now put together a data set of about 230 ancient human genomes that span 8,000 years of European history to see when the kind of different genetic components over the last 8,000 years form. So now we actually go um, forward in time, uh, starting about 8,000 years ago, and look at the genetic structure of Europe. What you see here in the background, those gray um, dots are the modern populations, and those are the ancient individuals. So the first thing you observe if you look at the ancient foragers, so the indigenous Europeans or Western Eurasians, you see that they form its little cloud here, and that there's a gradient from the west to the east. So this was the genetic structure of the hunter-gatherers that lived in Europe about 8,000 years ago. If you look at the same time into the region here, um, which is Turkey today, Anatolia, you can see that the Anatolians at that time, they only, only already pra practiced them agriculture, so they're Neolithic, so they're early farmers, and they're genetically actually quite distinct from those Europeans that lived at the same time in Europe. If you then move ahead in the next a thousand years, agriculture comes to Europe and suddenly when you look at the people that lived in Europe at the time, they look exactly like those Anatolian Neolithic farmers. So it seems very clear now that those, um, this Neolithic pack actually spread with those people because Europeans suddenly look like that and not like, look like that anymore. So there is very strong evidence now that there was this discontinuity of the people, that genetically there was this large change of people um, at that time period, about seven and a half thousand years ago in Central Europe. If we now move in the next 2,000 years of human history in Europe, we can actually see that the population structure doesn't really change so much. Genetically, people look, again, quite similar to those early farmers from Anatolia, but you can actually see a little bit of this movement in this direction, and this is indeed something that we observe, that there seems to be a bit of genetic admixture with hunter-gatherers, that lived in Europe at the time, probably still in mountain ranges and in regions where agriculture was not favorable. So there was a bit of genetic admixture between those early farmers and the hunter-gatherers that were living in Europe. However, again, this is modern Europeans. We're not really somewhere down here, so what's happening? We should kind of look a bit more to the east. And this is the same time period uh, that we just looked at in Central Europe, now looking at Eastern Europe, so looking at the populations which are and found here, so this is north of the Black Sea or of the Caspian Sea. We can actually see that this population, which is Neolithic or Bronze Age or steppe population, so those are also agriculturalists, but they're not sedentary, but pastoralists, so they're herding, for example, cows. Um, this population is very homogeneous, stretching all kind of this region here. And again, they're kind of falling up here, quite distinct from the early farmers of Europe, also quite distinct from the hunter-gatherers. And you can actually see they're also pretty close to this uh, eneolithic um, individuals here, which are actually late hunter-gatherers from this region, but they're a bit more stretched in this direction, in fact, and there seems to be something hiding here, and um, something I don't really have a time to talk today about, uh, but that would be a different uh, chapter in human history. But what's now going on with the modern Europeans that live um, uh, today in Central Europe? When does their genetic makeup actually form? And this has actually been happening about 4,800 years ago. 4,800 years ago, you suddenly have a major shift in the genetic structure of Europe. So if we move now to this time period, 4,800 years ago to about 3,000 years ago, suddenly you have people in Central Europe that look like people that live in Central Europe today. So they are a genetic mixture of this steppe component that we have in the Bronx Age here in the steppe, as well as this um, early and middle Neolithic people that you had in Central Europe at that time. So there seems to be a massive event of migration. Suddenly you see this massive shift and you don't only observe that in Central Europe and in Southern Europe, but you even observe that in uh, Central Asia as well as in the Altai. There seems to be a very strong evidence now for a large migration. 
We can then also quantify those genetic components in the different uh, populations that live in Europe today. So those three ancestral components, early the foragers, the uh, early farmers, as well as the steppe pastoralists, you can actually see there is a decline. So populations that live in northern Europe today or in northeastern Europe, they have quite a high amount of steppe ancestry and quite a low amount of early farmer ancestry, whereas the people that live in Sardinia today have almost exclusively early farmer ancestry, as I've shown you before, and very, very little ancestry here from the steppe. And if you look at the ancient populations, you can actually see that if you move from back in time towards today, you can see that early on we have this really strong component of early farmer ancestry from Anatolia. Over time, you have a little bit of this forager indigenous European admixture that seems to happen over the um, next a few thousand years. But then 4,800 years ago, we suddenly have this green component coming in, the steppe component. In Central Europe, we actually see about a 70% replacement of the local agriculturalists happening 4,800 years ago, an event that actually no archaeologist or paleoanthropologist had predicted so far. So there seems to have been really a mass migration at the end of the Neolithic. So in summary, what we can say is that agriculture likely spread from the Near East through Anatolia into Central Europe, starting about seven to 8,000 years ago. So it was actually people coming to Europe introducing agriculture. What we also have then, when the agriculturalists are spreading in different parts of Europe, going to Scandinavia in the next 2,000 years, to Great Britain as well as to Iberia, you seem to have a bit of genetic admixture with the local hunter-gatherers that are still present in Europe at the time. And then in the late Neolithic, about four and a half to 5,000 years ago, you have this, uh, it seems to be massive migration coming from this region here, um, from a culture which is called the Yamnaya, which is genetically extremely close with people that have a culture which is called the Corded Ware, that stretches all the way up to the Baltics, as well into Switzerland here and into Western Europe. So there was this massive migration which expanded into the, w the West here, into Central um, Europe, as well as into the other direction, into the Altai. Uh, mountains. And one of the big questions we currently have is how was that possible? We can easily um, explain why there was this first migration of agriculture to Europe because you could imagine that agriculture can sustain a much bigger population. So the first people that brought agriculture to Europe probably had a much bigger population size. But then why, how was it possible that 5,000 years ago those early farmers were replaced by other farmers? So what did those farmers have when they came here that kind of made them able to replace the people that lived in Central Europe. And we don't really have a good explanation currently, but our colleagues from Copenhagen recently published a study where they could actually find that in those people that came to Europe, they actually found Yersinia pestis, the causative agent of plague, which is actually quite incredible, but it seems that during this time, about four and a half thousand years ago, plague was for the first time introduced to Europe, potentially causing a pandemic. And you could imagine if we have a pandemic, like for example, during the Black Death, where 50% of the people in Europe died, if something like that happened five and a half thousand years ago, it could open an ecological niche so people could actually move in and then replace the local farmers. Um, just briefly, what we could also do is we could actually also look at genetic and phenotypic change through time. We could actually look at different phenotypes, how they change over the last 8,000 years, to so look at evolution basically in situ. What we saw was actually quite surprising that the first uh, uh, Europeans, or the Europeans that lived about 8,000 years ago, the hunter-gatherers, they actually had a very distinct phenotype from people that live in Europe today. They actually had dark skin and blue eyes. All of them, you can actually see that 100% frequency of those foragers had blue eyes and dark skin. So that actually goes down blue eyes frequency then with the early agriculturists and then spreads again in the last few thousand years. And the actually um, light skin that we have so typically in, in Europe today um, is in low frequency even in the um, early farmers, but only starts to spread in the Bronze Age. So this phenotype, which is so typical for Europeans, this light skin seems to be only about 4,000 years old. So actually quite a, a recent um, chapter in our evolution. What we could also show, which was quite um, interesting, is the ability to digest milk during adulthood, so lactase persistence. That's a phenotype that a lot of people attributed to the early agriculturalists, that basically those people that had cows were sh for sure then also able to drink um, a lot of milk, but actually the frequency in those people of this gene is actually zero, so they didn't have it. It only appears then during the Bronze Age, and it really spreads only in the last 3,000 years. And we're not even sure when it happens, during antiquity, during the medieval time, or maybe in the last few hundred years. 
I would like to um, then summarize that the Neolithic Revolution is really a diffusion of people. It was people coming to Europe. Those people brought genes, potentially new phenotype, but they also brought new diseases. And that's actually quite exciting, quite interesting, the first evidence we have of that. What we also can say now is it was not just one migration. It was not just those people from the Near East that brought agriculture, but there was a second large migration about 5,000 years ago. Again, we're not really sure why it was triggered by the introduction of diseases is one possibility. So by that, I'd like to thank a lot of collaboration partners for the first paper that I mentioned, um, mostly, of course, David Reich and his team, um, but also Soan de Pebo and his group in Leipzig. The second study I presented it was coordinated actually with Wolfgang Haug at Adelaide at the time, now with us in Jena and also David Reich's group. And the third paper I talked about, which was again coordinated by David Reich and um, Ian Matteson in Harvard. I'd like to thank my group, a lot of funding bodies, and you for your attention. So thank you. I was, I was very ambitious when I decided this title, and it's not going to be covered all of it uh, in 20 minutes, by, uh, for sure. But I'll try to cover as much as possible and give you an idea of what we know about the genetic history of the Americas, mostly informed by ancient DNA studies. So the, last continent to be, the Americas was the last continent to be settled by humans, and many questions um, have been debated as to where did the first people to enter the Americas came from, when did they, come, uh, did they come into the Americas, through what route, and if there was one major or two major or three major migrations into the Americas. So there has been a lot of debate in, and attempts to answer these questions. And many fields have contributed to the discussion, and genetics has been very important, but it, it has received contribution as well from linguistics, archaeology, paleoanthropology, paleoclimate, and other disciplines. And it is now um, kind of agreed that the first people to enter the continent did so from uh, Siberia, Northeast Asia, through Beringia around 15,000 years ago. And we set that date because the oldest human occupation site in the Americas is Monte Verde, which is here in Chile. And this human occupation site is dated to 14,000 to 14,500 years old. So the people who first entered the continent had to do so before then and like allow enough time for people to, to, to get here. So ancient DNA has contributed a lot to understanding um, exactly how this happened, uh, how people moved through the continent, and where did they come from. And we don't have thousands or hundreds of ancient genomes. We have only a handful uh, from, uh, from the Americas. So I will try to give you some of the insights that we've gained from studying ancient Native American genomes. So the first, first one is uh, this genome from the Ansic boy, which uh, were some remains found here in Montana, and were dated to around uh, 12,600 years old. And uh, they were found in association with these fluted on spear points, which were part of the Clovis culture. And as far as I know, these are the only remains that have been found in association to these tools. So this allowed the opportunity to investigate like, the genetic affinities of the Clovis um, culture. Uh, by, by studying the genome. When this genome was sequenced and compared to human populations around the globe, like contemporary populations around the globe, this heat map, flash map, uh, was generated, which basically shows in warmer colors the population. Each circle is a population. So in warmer colors, you have the co populations that have the highest genetic history sharing. So the first thing that was observed by sequencing this 12,000-year-old individual was that most Native Americans, or basically all Native Americans, are more similar to this individual than any other population in, in the world. And most interestingly, it was found that even though it was found like in the northern part of the Americas, it was more closely related or had genet more genetic affinity to Central and South American uh, contemporary individuals, Native Americans, actually. And, and this already gave us an idea about kind of the structure that was occurring in, um, in America, in the Americas, back then. And together with this observation and other statistical uh, analysis, the authors of this study, which I should mention is uh, Morten Rasmussen, who did this between uh, Copenhagen and Stanford, well, they came up with this model in which um, there was a, a divergence 
predating uh, the 12,000 years old of, of this ancient genome, a, a divergence between the North, uh, um, Northern Native Americans and the Southern uh, Native Americans, and that ANSIC would be sitting here. So this, this genome um, was very insightful in that it gave us um, an idea of some early population structure in the Americas, uh, predating the age of this genome. And it also you know, gave us a, the, the, the idea that most um, Native Americans today are descendants of a population related to this uh, Clovis-associated genome. A second genome um, that was sequenced just recently and published just recently and the source of a lot of debate was that of the Kennewick men. And uh, the, the remains uh, of this individual were found uh, in the Kennewick area in Washington, in, the, in Washington State. And uh, they were dated to 8,500 years. And there was, uh, again, this is a study by Morton Rasmussen. This was a source of a lot of controversy because the first analysis on, on the skeletal remains and particularly on the morphology of the skull. Um, so the scientists who did this first in analysis, they said that the, the morphology of the skull was more similar to uh, contemporary individuals of Southeast Asia uh, and Polynesians. So what that led to was to um, the owners of the land, which was actually the US Army, not giving the remains to the Native American tribes who were claiming these remains for reburial. Uh, and that was just based on the, on, on the scientists who, who draw these conclusions on the uh, morphology of the skull alone. So of course, there was a lot of scientific debate. Uh, debate and because the first attempts to extract DNA were un unsuccessful, um, there was uh, a lot of controversy and litigation for many years, uh, at least nine years. But finally, um, this group in Copenhagen, they're, they're very good at, at this. Uh, were given the opportunity to try again so, to do some genetic analysis, and they were able to sequence an entire genome of the Kennewick man. So the very first observation is that it actually falls within Native American vari uh, variation, just like that. So it's, this is a PCA plot similar to what Johannes just showed. These are Native, contemporary, contemporary Native uh, Americans. These are population from the rest of the world. This is Europe. So that was the first uh, result. This individual is Native American. And when looking at the genetic affinities more uh, within America, it was shown something similar to what was shown for ANSIC, for, for the ANSIC individual. It shares more genetic history with Central, Central North and South Americans than with, than with other Native Americans from the North, even though it was found here. But it was also interesting to find that Tribes for the same area uh, where the Kennewick man was found also shared uh, a high level of, of genetic uh, ancestry with, with the Kennewick man. So this added like another um, piece of evidence about the past genetic structure in the Americas. So again, with this observation and more uh, sophisticated statistical methods, what uh, this study proposed was that so this was the original branching between North, uh, Northern Native Americans and Southern Native Americans. The ANSIC sits here as an ancestor to modern uh, South and Central Native Americans. And that there was another branching here, and Kennewick is here, and um, that gave rise to Pacific Northwest Native Americans. Uh, but that there was so followed by some gene flow from East Asia that probably obscures a little bit the genetic affinity of the Kennewick to the uh, Pacific Northwest Native Americans. So this was a, a very important contribution and not only gave us insights about the, genetic, the past genetic structure of the Americas, but it also helped resolve uh, that this, this controversy about whether Kennewick man was Native American or not. And now uh, just an additional report supporting this was like published three days ago probably, so it hopefully uh, put an end to this litigation and these remains. Well, we don't know because many tribes are claiming the remains, so maybe they, there will be yet another debate. But anyway, this is what we learned from the scientific standpoint. And the third genome I will tell you is this uh, about is the, this from the Asakak Palio Eskimo, which is very interesting because it was sequenced from a tuft of hair, and this hair was preserved for around 4,000 years in the permafrost in southwest Greenland, and this is um, an art artistic reconstruction of the individual based on genotype, uh, like phenotypic 
information that was taken from the genome uh, that was sequenced. So this was actually the first ancient human genome to be sequenced, and again, uh, it was, this was done in Copenhagen by Morten Rasmussen and colleagues. So what we learned about this genome was also very interesting. So the SACAC individual was found here, but the genetic affinity, surprisingly, or not to some, are not to modern contemporary uh, Greenlanders. So this individual is genetically more similar to individuals from Siberia, like Chukchis and Koryaks here. So what this indicated is that there was probably a past migration, like predating 4,000 years ago, probably five to 6,000 years, a migration from East Asia to oh, Northeast Asia to the Americas that was later replaced by um, a population that gave rise to modern day Inuits. So these are like three single genome studies uh, but thanks to the developments in next generation sequencing, we have been able to generate now uh, multi or, se or yes, complete or semi uh, complete genomes from different uh, individuals, more than just one at a time. So we use, um, we generated some genomic data from multiple individuals to test one particular hypothesis. This was part of a larger study, but my contribution was testing this Paleo American relics hypo hypothesis. So again, based on the um, morphology of the skull, it was suggested that the very first people to enter the Americas, and for which we have remains, like for example, Lucia from the Guasanta and the Peñon woman, which are, who are really, really old, that the morphology of this skull is more similar to present day people from Melanesia. Some, some scientists suggest that, that there was a first migration of people with this Paleo-American skull that was later replaced completely by, uh, by Siberia, like the first migration I mentioned, and that it was a complete wipeout uh, and replacement. But that there were some uh, relict populations, because um, based on the morphology of the skull of some individuals who are in isolated parts of the continent, like the Pericus in the tip of Baja California and the Fogo Patagonians here, these have a particular uh, skull morphology that resembles also Austro-Melanesian. So this was the theory, and we wanted to test it. So we sequence uh, partial genomes from 17 individuals from these supposedly relic populations. And what we found, and we were actually expecting this already, was that they all fall within Native American variations. So there was no evidence of any connection to Austro-Melanesia whatsoever. But more interestingly, is that we observe a uh, genetic continuity with modern populations uh, in the same geographic area. For example, the people from uh, Fuego Patagonia in, in PCA space, um, they fall in uh, proximity to present day uh, Fuego Patagonians from, from Chile, so the Jagan from Chile. And similar in Mexico, these, the Pericus from Mexico not only fell within the native, um, variation, native uh, variation in Mexico, but they did so with the northern populations from Mexico. So we were able to pin down that they were very closely similar to Tarahumaras and, and Purepechas, which are northern native uh, groups in Mexico. So, well, first we just disproved this idea of relic uh, Paleo-Americans, and secondly, we demonstrated that there is this <coughs> genetic continuity. And actually, we've observed this in many samples now, in many genomes that have been sequenced. And we observed, so as I show a, a little bit with the Kennewick man that had genetic affinity to populations from the same geographic area, but we've observed uh, this uh, through almost 8,000 years, so we have different genomes from different ages here. And what we've been observing co uh, continuously is that there seems to be this genetic continuity in the Americas, and that is in, in contrast with what Johannes Joe showed of these massive demographic shifts. Um, so the Americas, at least Central and South America, the north, northern part seems to be a bit more complex, but at least Central uh, and South have been kind of very stable for many thousands of years. So that's interesting. Uh, a question that hasn't been resolved quite yet is if there were three or two migration waves into the Americas, different groups uh, with different data sets uh, from modern population support one or the other. So there's one uh, model that says that there was one major migration that gave rise to most Native Americans, followed by a second and a third that were mostly just Northern Native Americans. And there is another uh, model that instead of suggesting a second migration, suggests that there was divergence within America of a northern and a southern branch, and that this occurred within America approximately 
13 years ago. And something that has been uh, a bit puzzling for us who study genetic diversity in the Americas is the observation by two independent studies of something that looks like gene flow from uh, Austro-Melanesians or Papua New Guineans, or a population related to contemporary Papua New Guineans and Melanesians, into populations in the Amazonian, like the Chavante, Surui, and Caritiana. And two independent studies have identified this signal, although yet we don't have a good explanation of how or when this happened. So it's, it's very puzzling, actually. And um, just for, for the last part, I want to make the point that so far I've just talked about the peopling of the Americas, but there's actually much more genetic history in the recent 15,000 years, of course. So I think we can use ancient DNA to investigate, and, or a combination of ancient and modern DNA to investigate uh, other like regional aspects of the history of the Americas. Uh, an example here, for example, is the peopling of the Caribbean. By its location, you can argue it could have been people from Florida, from the Yucatan Peninsula, or from South America. And now, uh, using combining data from modern population, modern Caribbean population, and studying the Native American fraction of this population, um, and comparing to a reference panel of Native Americans, uh, it, it has been suggested that it was people actually by South America, here facilitated by the Orinoco River. And we have been able to kind of uh, prove this with ancient genomes, from Tain Taino genomes, um, and I'm just showing here a uh, an example of one sample from Cuba, from Chorro de Maita, Cuba, which also falls in the genetic variation of Arawak speakers, like Guajibo, Piapoco, and Ticuna. So this is another way where we can, we're complementing information from modern and ancient population to resolve a question about a particular event in, in history. And um, I'm also doing something along the same lines. I don't have the time to tell you more about but we're doing something similar in the peopling of the Patagonia. At like the very last part that was people in the Americas. And lastly, I want to make the point that we can also use ancient DNA even in historical times, but for events in history where the historical record is sparse. So um, I'll just show you an example where we use ancient DNA to learn about the past uh, history of people brought to the, to the Americas as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. You can argue that there are historical records about this, but this exact origins of people in Africa that were brought to the Americas, that was basically not recorded. It's kind of abs absent in the historical record. So we can also use ancient DNA to reconstruct some of this history. So in this very, very quickly, it was a pilot study where we had three individuals from, from the Caribbean, and we wanted to know where in Africa were they from. They were found in the same burial site. And by comparing to a reference panel in Africa, we sequenced fractions of their genomes, we were able to find that one of them was more closely related to Bantu-speaking populations, and two of them were more, was, uh, were more closely related to non-Bantu-speaking populations. And we had evidence to argue that these three people were put in the same uh, embarkation and brought to the Americas together. But the, we are really missing information about how culturally diverse were the people who were brought from Africa to the Americas. So, just to summarize, most Native Americans, because I, I went through something very general, like the peopling of the Americas, to something super specific about an ep episode in the history, but I want, to, I want you to take these messages uh, home. So most Native Americans trace their ancestry to a single migration uh, from East Asia to Beringia between 15 and 20,000 years ago. If there was one, uh, two, or three subsequent migration waves is still under debate. There is evidence of Asian gene flow from populations related to Austro-Melanesians into some Amazonian populations, although we don't know exactly how that happened. Um, the sequencing of ancient genomes from the America has complemented the knowledge generating from studying genome-wide data from modern populations, but we, st we still have very few compared to Europe, for example. And this last point is also something very important for me. Asian DNA research can also be useful for investigating other aspects apart from the initial peopling of the continent. I think we put too much attention into that. that we, we've forgotten about the more recent history or prehistory, uh, like the source populations of, uh, in Africa of the people who were brought during the transatlantic slave trade. And with that, I'll conclude, and thank you. <laughs>